Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. But first, a word from our sponsor. The Choctaw Nation has always provided a foundation upon which a future can be built. From our home in Southeast Oklahoma to a bingo hall that grew to be one of the largest casinos in the world. Today's summer school programs lay the groundwork for a love of learning. Small business programs support local economies. And with over 10,000 jobs created, Choctaw offers financial stability to tribal members and our neighbors. Together we build success because together we're more. On May 11, 2020, probably the most crucial case for the Native American community, McGirt versus Oklahoma, was argued in the Supreme Court. And by July 9th of the same year, it was decided upon that Creek, or what's now labeled Muscogee Nation lands, will remain Indian country via the Major Crimes Act. For all of us in the Native community, this is, for once, finally, a big win. And yet, it spurs many questions for those of us seeking to understand what it means for Oklahoma and what it means for the tribes. I should first start out by saying that Jim C. McGirt, a Seminole man named in the case that spurred groundbreaking change, was no hero. He was convicted in 1989 of child sexual abuse and then in 1997 of sex crimes against a four-year-old child, his wife's granddaughter, in fact, But he fought back, stating that the state of Oklahoma had no jurisdiction over him since he committed his crime within the boundaries of the Muscogee Nation, which would be federal jurisdiction under the Indian Major Crimes Act. By the way, because since the state's conviction was withdrawn, the federal court then needed to rule. On August 25th, 2021, this animal, Jim C. McCurt, at age 72, was sentenced to life in prison. I hear he's been in prison complaining about the food being high in sodium and carbs and not being a comfortable setting, bless his heart. Okay, so I have so many more questions about the significant court ruling, as I'm sure do some of my listeners. What does this mean for the state of Oklahoma and for Native individuals? And will Oklahoma now have reservations? So I'm bringing in the real experts. Let's get some answers straight from our chief, Gary Batten, and Kara Bacon, prosecutor for the tribe. Chief and Kara, it's great to visit with you again here at the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Thanks for making time for me and helping our listeners understand this crucial decision. Well, Halito, Rachel. Halito, Rachel, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. And by the way, I have to admit, Kara and I are kindred spirits because she actually lived in my hometown for a while in Anadarko. And we look alike, so there's that too. (laughs) Kind of crazy. All right, so let's go back just a bit and paint the historical picture would you guys help us understand the history of the former Oklahoma reservations and what many of us know as trust land? Sure. Well, I mean, one of the things when you think about the history of the, the Choctaw Nation, when we signed the Treaty of Dance and Rabbit Creek, when we came from Mississippi to Indian Territory at that time, we had fee patent title, which is the best title you can have. It was on the United mm-hmm. States, Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. We owned all of this property in south, the southern part of the, the state now. That was, and what this has proven is that land was never disestablished. That reservation was never disestablished. It's still in that same status. And I think that's really kind of thrown everybody for a loop because they don't understand. But it's more than just the land itself. It's about jurisdiction. I think people are getting jurisdiction and land confused. Mm -hmm. This ruling says that our reservation was never disestablished, so we maintain the jurisdiction now, land ownership and so on is a completely different situation. And I always like to explain to people, they actually own their own land, but in the state of Oklahoma. In the state of <clears throat> right. Oklahoma, in other areas outside of our reservation, they have jurisdiction. So it's the same concept. I hope people can understand it. And this hmm. ruling was in specific to just the Major Crimes Act. So when you think about murder, you know, rape, those types of things... Those are the issues. Now, when we start talking about civil, you know, that those are the things that we're going to have to look at into the future and see how this really impacts 
the Choctaw Nation and the the remaining part of the people that reside in our reservation. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question is, what does it mean for Oklahoma, but what does it mean for the individual? Let's say I'm on Choctaw land and I commit a crime, probably stealing Dr. Pepper from the Piggly Wiggly. But what would have happened to me before this case was decided versus today? Well, one of the things I think that we always had, which I don't know if people really understand, the, the reservation, which is a fee patent title, but then there's also what's called tribal trust land, which is land held in trust by the United States of America for the tribe, the Choctaw Nation. Mm -hmm. And then there's also what's called individual allotment of land. And so like, for example, my grandmother received 160 acres and my grandfather did. We still have that original allotment of land. But the point being is back then, uh, prior to, we still had our court system in place. Now, maybe not at the level, well, it definitely wasn't at the level it is today, but if you were caught on uh, tribal trust land, for example, and you were a Native American, then you would be prosecuted in our court system or by the federal government. And where and, did that change? Well, it's never really changed. What I think what this has clarified is now that every Native American in our reservation, in our jurisdiction now, mm -hmm. will either go through our court system or through the federal court system. Now, the issue really becomes, though, is a non-Indian that's doing something illegal in our area. And of course, that's where we done, we have done cross-deputization with all of our local law enforcement and so on, so that they shouldn't have to worry about public safety should be number one. So it should be you capture whoever's committing the crime and then you determine jurisdiction. So if they're a Native American, guess what? They come to our court system or go to the federal court system. If they're a non-Indian, and of course, Kara can describe more specifically, and I know I'm being very broad, but a non-Indian committing just a crime against another, another non-Indian, mm -hmm. that falls under the state. So okay. they would get prosecuted the same way, but for some reason, people have made this, and I believe personally that our governor of the state of Oklahoma has made this where it's trying to be chaotic. We have not let one case go through that has not been prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Nobody at that time was released. Now, they were released from the federal government potentially or the state custody. We immediately picked them up under our custody. Like Mr. McGirt. Yeah, yes, he, like he Mr. Never, McGirt. Yeah, yeah, he never and he left was prison. Prosecuted and... and so, but the thing is, people want to believe that there's lawlessness going around. That's just not the case because Kara and them were I mean, hard. I can't remember. How many cases did you file? Within the first week, we filed over 200 cases. Wow. Um, just to make sure that people who were incarcerated uh, remained incarcerated, and they would either be processed through our tribal court system or through the federal court system. Okay. And I think Chief's right. I mean, you know, one of the, I think the most impactful parts of that decision was Justice Gorsuch saying, you know, on the far end of the Trail of Tears, there was a promise. And I think every Native <laughs> um, that read that felt like, hey, it's about time. The U.S. government is going to be held to the treaties they made with our First Nations mm -hmm. uh, when they removed our peoples from their homelands. So I, I think for all of us, that was very moving. It was never about getting criminals off, it was more about recognition of tribal sovereignty. And yes, I think yes. that that's what we miss. And I think that's what Chief focused on early on mm -hmm. when he said, I don't want people to get out of prison who've committed crimes. And, and oh, he, he made yeah. sure that we started a Sovereignty for Strong Communities Committee. Kind of had the fortune of watching what the Creeks did mm -hmm. and, and to see, you know, some of the pitfalls they ran into and try to make sure that we didn't fall into those same pitfalls yeah. by having cross deputization agreements. He said, I want you to work with your state partners. I want you to reach out. I want to make sure we have our cases. And I think we did that here at the Choctaw Nation to make sure that we were prepared when our Sizemore decision came down in July or Good April. Point. I'm sorry. And, and I think, you know, last time I was here, you were saying goodbye to the chief of the Creek Nation. He was on his way out. I was like, oh, okay. So it's really neat to see that you guys probably get together often, right? Or, or at least oh. have conversations? Well, we have conversations just about every week. If, yeah. And uh, and so we talk about what's working, what's not working in yeah. our areas. And of course, I think everybody will say the cross deputizations work really well. Yeah. And however, for people that are confused about it, we do have certain areas that they do not want to do a cross deputization with us. And they'll go, well, look, this Native American is going free. Well, guess what they did? They went to, I had that situation, I had a call from a sheriff this weekend where a guy had gotten shot in the face. They were debating whether to, to do something to that person because he might be Native American. 
I told him, you need to arrest the individual that's responsible for this. We'll determine jurisdiction after that. That's what they did. Uh, I don't even know if the person was Native American or not. They'll have to prove they didn't know that we had a toll-free line that you can call mm -hmm. and we verify whether they're a tribal member up front or not. But again, they shouldn't have to worry about that with their cross deputization agreements. Right. They should just go get the bad person. They face no liability for right. that, no more than they normally do. And then we determine who truly has jurisdiction. If they're Choctaw, then yeah. they come to our court system. And it's about the court system at yes. that point. And Rachel, you mentioned you grew up in Anadarko, mm -hmm. and I know that we're, we might be jumping ahead, but I know that's a little bit different because yeah. in the eastern part of the state has always relied on cross deputization agreements. Um, since our tribal police have been established, yes. I know the Choctaw Nation especially has entered into a ton of cross deputization agreements. Now, mm -hmm. we may have expanded on those uh, post McGirt and made sure that we had colleges, state entities, um, we have OHP, ATF, um, mm -hmm. I believe the fire marshal. So we may have expanded on those, but we have always had those types of agreements with our state counterparts here in the southeastern part of the state. Right. And you don't see that everywhere. I no, know you rely, no, right? <laughs> you, you rely on uh, BIA police in other areas that I've worked mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. And so it is a little bit different. And it's been an adjustment for everybody in Oklahoma to understand because not every place in Oklahoma True. has these types of cross deputization agreements, but they're not uncommon. Um, uh, in fact, they're fairly common. Most of the major, or the larger tribes, the five tribes, utilize and mm -hmm. have utilized these types of agreements to make sure that citizens are protected, regardless of who responds. And this is five civilized tribes country over here. And again, Anadarko is more like Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, Caddo. So. And you know, it's been interesting too, Rachel, that we've hired 60 law enforcement officers since McGirt. We, oh, we wow. had about 20 already yeah. that had already worked through cross deputization agreements, and we've always assisted those communities. But now with us having 60, that's put 60 more additional law enforcement in mm -hmm. all these counties that the people love. Because yes. now they have more coverage, they have more backup, they have more resources yeah. if they're willing to use them. Right. Now, the problem is a lot of times they will not use us. And because they want to do it, like I said, oh, that's a Native American issue. Let's let them handle it. It okay. means that if we're off uh, an hour away, then we have to show up or something like that. But if they will work with us, uh, matter of fact, that's what we did with this sheriff. We just like, let us sit down and, and walk you through our processes to make sure you're verified that you do not have to question anything. You get to handle the situation up front. And then we'll help you on our, in regards to whether it's uh, tried at our court or it's at, at state mm -hmm. court. When we talk about major crimes, there's a misconception that the tribe does not have authority to prosecute major crimes, and that's not correct. Okay. When we talk about exclusive jurisdiction for major crimes, that's speaking to the state, exclusive from the state, that the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction from the state to prosecute major crimes. Tribes have always had the ability to prosecute major crimes. We've not been limited in our ability to prosecute. We've been limited in our sentencing authority. Okay. And so prior to 2010, tribes were limited in up to a year or up to $5,000 for any type of crime, whether that was murder or a larceny. Yeah. Um, and so there wasn't the incentive to prosecute a major crime. Now, some nations have. I think the Navajo Nation is one that has always prosecuted major crime because their land base has been so large mm -hmm. that when the federal government would not file or decline to file a case, they would do something. But after 2010, I think around Indian country, there was concerns that um, people were not being prosecuted appropriately when they did commit crimes and the federal government did not act. And so they expanded, they created what's called the Tribal Law and Order Act, and that expanded jurisdiction to tribes who opted in, and they had to ensure certain things, that you had uh, the rights, due process rights, mm -hmm. basically that are afforded under the United States Constitution, right. and had to ensure that everything was on the record. Record, and it gave tribes enhanced sentencing power for up to three years per felony charge and up to $5,000 or up to nine years per count, so yes. in one case. So that gave all tribes a little more incentive to prosecute major crimes when there was a declination at the federal mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But just, I think it's, it's very interesting, Rachel, that uh, for me anyway, that guess who limited us on this ability to sentence? The federal government. 
I guess they thought that we were not capable of sentencing more than three years at a time. That's a law that desperately needs change. I mean, if we want to, to give somebody the death penalty, uh, that's up to our people. But but if we chose to, that should be our right to choose yes. that, not the federal government telling us that we can only give a person that's committed rape or murder only three years and, and consecutive up to nine years. To me, that's ridiculous. Absolutely. So we're uncovering so much here. I mean, there was a lot more to this the, than I even thought. Yeah, and I, of I think the limits on sentencing power are so antiquated when you look now at the technology and, and you look around at the type of facilities we have. Mm -hmm. And um, I really think it's an antiquated way of thinking to think yeah. that tribes can't handle that sentencing authority or can't handle that power. Well, and I'm excited too today because I'm going to be able to tour the judicial center that you have over here. Um, what is that the term for it? Yes. The, the yes. building over here? Okay, so, and it's a newer facility, right? I yes, think. matter of fact, we built that prior to McGirt. Oh, uh, you did? And, and that, just to let you know, that was part of, as the chief, I don't know, and I know we were look, going to talk about that, but we do have an executive, uh, legislative, and judicial branch. And one of the areas that I thought as the chief, I thought we have never really focused on the judicial. Now, did we have a court system in place? Yeah. And did we have some code and or law, if you will? Yes, we did. But I felt like the judicial branch was not embracing their full power, mm -hmm. their authority. And so uh, that's the reason why we built this. Well, we actually had court at Tushkahona, and then we expanded oh, really? it to Tallahanna, and then it got too small. And then we was built this new court, uh, our judicial center, which is state of the art. You can file electronically. You can do nice. so much more than the county courthouses and so on. So it was our effort. And I'm just fortunate I, uh, that it turned out that McGirt ruling came. And then we're poised and ready. Talk to, about to vision. Yeah, well, I don't you know? know if that, it was that, that or blind luck, one or the other. I'm not sure which one it was. But, but it, we were just very fortunate to have it in place, though. And then, of course, we were able to have uh, judges. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we uh, we had already started on legal and compliance on the executive branch side. So we were able to, we already had uh, about 20 attorneys on board with us. And then, of course, we had law enforcement in place. So it was easier for us to expand mm -hmm. and grow into where we are today as opposed, I could only imagine, if we would have had to start from scratch, we would have been, oh, yeah. we would still be struggling totally. right now. And Kara, you were probably like, yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I was excited when I came here because not only did Chief and them expand mm -hmm. the Judicial Center and, and build a, a courthouse that has three courtrooms, state-of-the-art mm -hmm. technology, but also all of their codes were already in place. Many of uh, the codes that were necessary were already in place. Yeah. We had criminal procedure codes, civil procedure codes. Um, so I was really surprised when I took the position here yeah. uh, uh, that everything was already laid out for me in a sense. Uh, a we had to make some modifications with McGirt, but I mean, we had a good baseline to start mm -hmm. with. Wow, that's great. Very exciting. I think if I were an attorney, I would appreciate that too, a prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> so since this decision, the other four of the five civilized tribes, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Seminole, have joined the Muscogee Nation and have now received recognition as reservations. They then jointly stated, the nations and the state are committed to implementing a framework of shared jurisdiction that will preserve sovereign interests and rights to self-government while affirming jurisdictional understandings, procedures, laws, and regulations that support public safety, our economy, and private property rights. We will continue our work confident that we can accomplish more together than any of us could alone. So, Chief, you were part of making that statement so sure. cool when I was reading well, and, it. And um, I firmly believe that, and I still believe that. Now, do I believe the governor of the state of Oklahoma believes that? Probably I do not. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is because, you know, the, one of the pieces in there is to affirm our sovereignty, mm. which means that, that he has to accept, the state of Oklahoma has to accept that we have jurisdiction that the, the Supreme Court again ruled that we have jurisdictional yes. boundaries in, on our reservation. He does not want to accept it. He just wants to get that overturned. And so that's the reason why I strongly, and, and probably this is the most I uh, have ever really said negatively mm -hmm. about our governor, but I mean, we totally are in opposition. Now, does that mean we can work on other things? I'm still going to work, sure. work with him on things that's better for our tribal members, better for the state of Oklahoma. You bet mm -hmm. I am. But he's got to be willing to accept that. And do I think that at the end of the day that we will get there? I do. I think it's going to uh, be some hard negotiations. Mm -hmm. And to me, I don't even want to go to the negotiating table right now. That's where me and the Chickasaws and the Cherokees, I feel like that we need to explore every opportunity 
for me to maximize sovereignty for our tribal members. I don't know that yeah. we even know exactly. We, we know what McGirt means, but you know, when we get to the civil side, does that mean we do pay taxes? We do not pay taxes. Right. You know, there, there's all of these questions and what, uh, what is best for our tribal members because we're part of the community. We pay taxes to pay roads and we do all those things. So what is best for us? I believe we really need to sit down and explore all those opportunities. Then I might be, if, if we're not doing something that's better for our tribal members and our community, then I might be willing to sit down and negotiate. People said, you know, it's just kind of sad that it's taken, what, uh, from 1832 to uh, 1830 right. until now, that, that this loss of what's even worse is we've accepted it. Yes. Mm -hmm. We truly, as people, we just up. like, uh-oh, the state of Oklahoma has jurisdiction over us, and we accepted it. We do not need to accept that. We need to explore all those opportunities and see what truly is available to us and our non-tribal members that live in the communities within there. Because, again, right. why would I want to do something? My wife is a non-tribal member. Right. Why would I want to do something that negatively impacts her? Yeah. I mean, it's all about the greater good, and I think sometimes we want... Jurisdiction for the nation, jurisdiction for the state, jurisdiction, but what is best at the end of the day? And that's what we have to really look at. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think the reasoning is behind his not want, the governor not wanting to recognize that sovereignty? I mean, for me, it's just the old adage of power and control. Yeah. Because otherwise, it, it'd be like me if I just said, well, I'm just taking it all mm -hmm. and, and just said, we're going to embrace it. Well, guess what? Then I have to pay. What if they want to start paying tolls for the roads? Right. What if they want us to start charging us for, for our kids going to public school systems? I mean, there's for every decision, there's pros and there's cons. So yeah. you have to really think through this versus just saying, I want it all. Mm -hmm. And again, do I want to maximize that sovereignty? You bet. And I'm going to do everything I can to protect our tribal members. But there are certain things that you have to say, this is not good for the greater good of all. And right. that we just have to weigh those out. I bet our chiefs of yesteryear are looking at you right now going, you got this. Whatever exactly. it is, we got your back. <laughs> well, can you imagine, though, that after all that time that they fought all those people that's died and everything else, and then me just going, oh, let's turn that over to the yeah. state. I just, you know. I think that's, that would be really unfathomable for me to do that. And do you think that the other tribes are kind of where you are right now too, where they're like, okay, let's hit pause for a second? I think so. I think people are starting to really feel the impact mm -hmm. of McGirt and what it means. I feel like all the other tribes are starting to go, wow, you know, this is, this can be a positive thing if we work together. Yeah. Now, again, if we have to go to court, if we have to fight this battle constantly, that just means we're going to spend a lot of uh, dollars on attorneys yeah. and, and fighting. But I think if we will truly sit down, I mean, I think about the Indian Child Welfare Act. We've worked with the state of Oklahoma where right, right now we have children out maybe in Woodward, Oklahoma, yeah. way out in the western part of Oklahoma. We do not have anybody stationed out there. The closest place we can have somebody is Oklahoma City. Well, well, guess what? If they find out that there's a Choctaw out there, then they notify us. We decide. We, we decide with our Choctaw child whether we're going to take that case or whether we want to keep it with the state. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's about proper resourcing. If, if we can't provide the family to get that family back together and that child the, the services that they need, wouldn't it be better to let the state handle that? Right. Well, again, my thing is sovereignty is about the ability to choose. So we have that child is ours. We want to protect them as much as possible. So we're choosing what's best yeah. for that child, whether they come into child cust or Choctaw custody or stay with the state. But again, th there's things like that. We signed that agreement probably, what, three months ago or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's things like that that we can work out because, again, if you look at resources, manpower, what works best, that's what you have, what's best for our Choctaw people, not what my ego wants to grab. Oh, don't you wish that were on a national level? You know, like, <laughs> maybe some of our politicians out right. there <laughs> think about what's best for the people. I, that's just such a crazy concept. To yes, me. it is. <laughs> Well, thanks for helping us get to the bottom of this. As tribal members, we need to know this information. The chief has taken time out of his day to help us all understand, so there's no excuse now, y'all. We need to educate ourselves and stay informed. Now let's shift gears a bit. 
there are some out there who don't understand the branches of American government, much less the way tribal government works. So since we're on this exciting legal kick today, perhaps you can help us out with this too. So Kara, I'm excited to ask you about this. If the branches of American government are similar to the way the tribe works too, there's the chief like the president, there's the assistant chief like the vice president, and feel free to take it from here and maybe explain it to us much better than I can. So we have our tribal council, which are our legislative branch, and they pass our laws. They also control the purse strings. <laughs> I have to go make... to them to get approval from, for the annual budget. Oh, make sure you're good friends with exactly. them. Exactly. Give, give them some and, and lunch. And they are supposed to voice or be the voice uh, or representatives of the members within their districts. Okay. Whether they live outside of the district or whether they actually live in, wherever they're registered. Mm -hmm. Then we have our judicial branch, and our judicial branch has a district court and an appeals court. Okay. And then we have a constitutional court. And the constitutional court answers questions regarding the Constitution. And so that is made up of a chief justice and then two non-attorneys. So the United we'll, States Constitution no, or the Choctaw the Constitution? The Choctaw Constitution, okay. yes. Yeah. So the, say, for example, Rachel, that I disagreed that the legislative body were going past their power of authority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would go to the constitutional court and say, we're asking you, petitioning you to make a decision on whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. And then okay. they would make the ruling and then that's they would we would have to live by whatever their ruling may be. Interesting. And so Kara, when you went to law school, do you, you studied the US Constitution and the Choctaw Constitution? So we studied the law and how to approach the law and how to analyze the law. Yeah. But in law school, I also talk, uh, took a lot of courses in federal Indian law. So I understood oh, okay. the tribe's unique status to the federal government yeah. and then how tribes were self-governed, how they were a political subdivision and not a race-based organization, mm -hmm. which I knew because I was Choctaw growing up. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, law school teaches you how to apply the law <laughs> and, and, and how to look at the law and how to make understandings. I did not really get into the to the weeds with the with the Choctaw Constitution until I started working here. Okay. I knew the branches of government. I, knew, I generally knew, but I didn't understand all the powers and duties and how we are a little bit different from mm -hmm. the state court mm -hmm. and the federal court, especially in our judicial branch and our tribal council and in name. One of the unique things that you won't see in uh, the U.S. Supreme Court that we do have here is we have lay members, non-attorneys, that are part of our constitutional court, which is kind of interesting because yeah. they bring a unique perspective to that when they're applying the Constitution. So we have two lay members and then one attorney member. They're all members of the Choctaw Nation. And then we have an appeals court and we have a district court. And the district oh. court is where most of your crimes will take place. Just like at the state level, they have a district court, which okay. is where you have your divorces, your custody, your um, guardianship, your mental health, and your criminal cases. Okay. But we only have one appeals level. Makes but, sense. And one thing, Rachel, I want to make sure that everybody understands is our Constitution, of course, we regained our Constitution in 1983. Mm -hmm. And so if you can think our, our tribe is fairly new mm -hmm. again from that mm -hmm. perspective. But, uh, you know, and I'm going to kind of summarize this, which means that as the chief executive officer, the chief of the Choctaw Nation, I run the day-to-day -day operations of the Choctaw Nation, make decisions uh, based on the best for the Choctaw Nation. Our uh, legislative body, our tribal council, as uh, Kara was saying, they do approve the budget every mm -hmm. year. And then they're, uh, they're also responsible for passing laws. Now, do I concur? Either I have to concur with the law, I can veto the law. Mm. Now, if I veto it, they can override my veto with uh, 7 out of the 12 votes. Okay. So they can still pass law even if I disagree with them. And then the judicial branch is mainly for interpreting laws that the tribal council and I have passed and or just the tribal council has passed. So my point being is there's balance in that power. I mean, a lot of times people think tribes, you know, as the chief, you just get to do whatever you want right. to do. There's always, I can't, I can't do anything unless council approves still that budget. Body. I still have to have their approval before I purchase anything, acquire anything, do any operational. And then even if I did something illegal, then the judicial branch, has to monitor all of that. Same thing with the council, judicial. If they did, I mean, the legislative body, if they did something illegal, then I could go to the judicial branch, make sure that they're held accountable. So there's a good uh, part of checks and balances in regards to our constitution as a whole. For sure. So, I mean, there's still a governing body. Can't just go out there and 
set up snow cone stands all over the exactly. place. Exactly. Well, I that, wouldn't. I wouldn't be opposed to that. I think uh, one of the things that's interesting, though, for most tribes, and I think it's it's a, a just a new mindset for our tribal council. When we were doing our strategic planning this year, I asked them. I said, "So, what laws are you considering passing for this coming year? What do you think is critical mm-hmm. for our Choctaw people?" Well, a lot of them hadn't really thought about that because you know we have fish and wildlife, we have mm-hmm. air, we have environmental issues, we have food. Mm-hmm. You know, all these things. We do have codes for those, but do they need to be clarified? Do they need to be expanded? You know, because we're going to be responsible with this McGirt ruling. Yeah. I always say with great responsibility comes accountability. So somebody gets sick at our casino who checked out the food, we have to verify that we okay. check that out. Somebody has a chemical spill at one of our travel plazas. We can't say, state, go check that out. We are going to be responsible mm. and accountable for doing those things. And so that's where it's costing us on the executive branch is to make sure that I just don't want to say, oh, sure, we'll take this. And, and we want to make sure that we're a sovereign nation. But, oh, if you slip and fall or if you die here, that, oh, too bad. You can't right. do that. You right. have to be accountable. You have to be responsible. We have to make sure that people are safe mm-hmm. in our environment, in our jurisdiction. Absolutely. And one so of, that's sense. one of the things the Sovereignty for Strong Communities um, a task force that Chief implemented has done is looked at the codes prior to the Sizemore decision, which is the decision that mm-hmm. found that the Choctaw Nation reservation boundaries were not disestablished. Okay. And we have updated mental health codes, Chief. We've updated our criminal codes. I mean, and, and you know, just like the state of Oklahoma and, and the federal government are constantly making amendments to codes, we're mm-hmm. doing the same thing now. We are actively looking to make sure there aren't holes that people uh, yeah. slip through, that there's not um, a deficits in our codes. So it's it's really important, and it's an exciting time to be at the Choctaw Nation and working here oh, yeah. and working on those projects. Oh, I bet. This would be you know, a dream for someone <laughs> working for the nation right now to be here at this time. And to me, it's a great time to truly partner, because even just like um, our prisoners, mm-hmm. well, guess what? We don't have a prison. So oh. we have to, we contract with all the local uh, counties and, th- and some cities to make sure that they house our prisoners. So people don't think about things like that. Yeah. They don't think about, well, we have juveniles, mm-hmm. that there's a problem. Well, if they're mental health, we're, what mental health facility? Those right. are the things that we have to truly accept and, and assess to see where we're at. Is it something we need to build or is it something we can partner? Mm-hmm. Not just with the state, but with private entities you know, whatever it may be, so that we can make sure, again, to meet the needs of our people. So, you're going to be super busy over the next few years. <laughs> and you too. Well, I think it's it's already started, but I, I don't know that uh, tribal members really grasp, mm-hmm. and, and people in general, I think we've been colonized for yeah. so long mm-hmm. that we've accepted that this is just the way the system works. And yeah. so, we have to get past that. We have to think outside of the box. I mean, and I apologize, but I always call it part of our court system, peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I wanted a peacekeeper's court, which basically what it is, is I think that people will do better, adhere to Mm -hmm. policies, procedures, law, if somebody that they respect is telling them what to do. And the peacekeepers is our court system where it's of our grandmothers, grandfathers, that's telling them, why aren't you paying your child support? (laughs) That is awesome. You know, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you? And then hopefully that will uh, help, again, that person grow. And hopefully it will help that family that he helped start or she helped start that's not paying their child support. And hopefully, again, get everybody back on the right track. Because, again, that's what we want to do. Because otherwise it's just back in jail or back in, you know, getting fined or whatever We have to learn to break that cycle. Break the cycle. So is there anything else you'd like for tribal members to know as we're talking through this today? I'm putting you on the spot, but what do you want them to know? Well, I think uh, hopefully they understand just by us talking the magnitude of it, because I hear so many tribal members saying we want to, to, you know, don't let the state have anything, you know, to other people saying, you know, we don't need to take this on because it's going to cost too much. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that hopefully they will be open minded and look at all aspects of do they really understand sovereignty, Mm -hmm. what it entails from 
I mean, because Kara just touched on some of it, whether it's mental health issues, mm -hmm. you know, it's juvenile. I mean, it's it's the whole gamut. I mean, from murder, rape, you know, on down, and from fish and wildlife again to environmental issues. And I'm just trying to think of some of the things. You no, know, Chief's exactly right, and you know, that's the same question I think we've get we've gotten asked mm -hmm. is well, what can you do better? Why do you think this is a good thing? And I'll say, well, I've worked for the state of Oklahoma, and I do think that we are uniquely positioned to deal with our people better. And one of mm -hmm. the most important things I've seen since I've come here is that when we deal with drugs and alcohol, Chief and Tribal Council have put a lot of funding into Chahola Lee and men's mm -hmm. recovery and behavioral health and making sure that we are utilizing resources to help mm -hmm. get people off of those substances that keep them down or keep them committing crimes or keep them incarcerated. So instead of funding a whole lot of incarceration or jail beds for people who commit crimes that are drug related, yeah. we try to first utilize a, a holistic or a rehabilitation approach. And I think that is something that the state of Oklahoma has not, you know, in years past, they've right. cut funding for those positions. It is so hard to get someone into treatment if they're non-native in Oklahoma mm -hmm. because they haven't seen that as an issue. And it is an overwhelming issue for anyone who lives in Oklahoma. Yeah. The other thing that I think we're uniquely suited to do is when we talk about domestic violence, you know, one of the things that is very important to note here is that we do an evidence-based prosecution. We have tribal resources devoted for both members and non-members because we can have victims who are members mm -hmm. and we can have men, uh, victims who are native and victims who are non-native. Mm -hmm. If the offender is, is native, we will prosecute and we can prosecute non-natives under our special domestic violence jurisdiction. So we have resources that will help victims of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, transitional housing needs getting them groceries, helping with utilities, helping get them in a place where they are secure enough to leave that relationship that's volatile. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we do is we do have mandatory jail time on, on our cases because we know it's important to have a cooling off period. Yeah. As a prosecutor for 10 years, what I always harp on is I know a majority of the homicides that I've had were related to intimate partner violence, which is mm -hmm. devastating. And I know this community has seen it firsthand in some of the recent cases around here. But to prevent that, what we have to do is take a strong stance on domestic violence. Yes, uh, the tribe has done that. The tribe has devoted resources to that. Our office specifically has made that a priority in continuing with evidence-based prosecution. And that means when a victim is you know, um, still reeling from the trauma of domestic violence and maybe unsure about showing up and facing that, that offender in court, that we have our officers trained to collect the evidence we need to go ahead and move forward in that prosecution, even if she's un she or she is unable to appear. Yeah. So I think those are some important things that get lost in the, the, the Governor Stitt drama of the yeah. sky is falling, but we are uniquely suited to handle the problems that face the tribal nation. And yes. I think that's important to, to let our, our, our members know. Well, I think, Rachel, for me, I think people want to say sovereignty, not sovereignty. And the things that, why do we have sovereignty? It's because of our people. Mm -hmm. And they have to remember there's people behind every one of these cases. So we have to make sure, because just like Kara was saying, I mean, we have victims that we're trying to help. Mm -hmm. That's maybe they had a person that was murdered in their family or rape or incest. Right. You know, all these things that a lot of times we do not like to talk about or not like to think about, mm -hmm. but we have to face those things head on and figure out what's the best solution for that. Yeah. And not just take, well, let's just throw somebody behind bars, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes the, is that needed? Sure. But uh, my thing is, is how do we best rehabilitate those people? How do we best help those victims? How do we, again, help people progress through using a very traumatic time in their life that they mm -hmm. dealt with? And I don't think people get that a lot of times. They just see these court cases and I don't like this or I don't like that. But there's really people behind every one of those cases. It'd be, I'm really curious to see if you could put a per capita comparison between the state versus the Choctaw way of you know, handling things, you know, is there, are there better results on this side of the fence with what well, all those programs you're talking about? I hope so. I mean, I hope at the end of the day, that's our goal is that we have better results. And, and I, I, you know, I've told our court system that I wanted to make sure that we're the top one in the United States. I want to be better than the yes. federal government. You know, why should we Do accept it. anything less? And can you tell us a little bit more about the districts? So like I'll be in district two tomorrow in Ho Chi Town. So 
in that case, you talked about the councilmen and women and how they have certain things that they do with the budget and all that, but what are they doing for those districts as well? Well, by our constitution, by population, they have their districts established. And now, again, that's within our reservation. If you live outside of our reservation, you choose which district you wish to be affiliated. So you actually get a little bit more of a benefit because you get to choose who represents you. You know, now don't get me wrong. And what I mean by that, so if you're in District 2 in Northern McCurtain County, you only get to vote for that people that's running for that district. If you go, well, I live in California, I decided I want to choose District 1, mm-hmm. 3, you, so you get to choose and vote for your, your council person. But their their main goal is to be an advocate for those people in that area. So they, they deal with all the tribal members. They know their issues. They hear their concerns. They advocate. They bring those to our strategic planning process. Mm-hmm. And work, that's where we go back to working together between what I hear that our tribal members need, what they hear, and then we develop our strategic plan, and then we have a budget that we submit to them that hopefully supports everything that tries to meet those tribal members' needs. Yeah. And, but then also they're responsible for, like we said, the, the laws for those areas. So they're, mm-hmm. they're again, hearing from their tribal members going, hey, we, you know, we can't hunt, we can't fish and hunt or whatever, or maybe they're, we would like to be able to trap more or be able to use some of our traditional bows or something like that, then they could choose to pass laws yeah. to, to make that better. And again, I know that's making it simple, but it's way more sure. greater than that. The yep. responsibility I'm looking for is, terms today. But, <laughs> but that's, that's their biggest role out there is the mm-hmm. advocacy and the passage of law and passage of the budget. Okay. Good information for sure. We talked earlier about Anadarko and how different areas of the state may operate differently than say the Choctaw Nation or the Creek Nation, for instance. And we talked about the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs versus the the federal government and where do those two things overlap and where does one win over the other. And and the reason I'm asking is the topic of BIA versus federal government always made me scratch my head just a little bit. On my family's level, we could call the Indian police or the Anadarko police. And we were so far out in the country that your guess would be as good as mine as to if either one of them would show up or when or whatever. And we had an incident one time where my dad was on a trip and a man who was high drove up into our land late at night and he was surveying our house to rob us. And we called the Indian police and, and they never came. Nothing against them. They must have just been busy. But our pastor who also lived in the country came and he pointed his shotgun at him and eventually the guy left and we felt kind of just isolated out there. We were so far out, but the same thing kind of would happen in, in town too sometimes, but it was just short staffed, you know, small town, low budget, all that. So, but even more top of mind was one morning when I was about seven years old, we were driving to town and to our right, we could see out of the car window that a man, I believe he was Kiowa, he had hung himself from a tree and he hung there for many hours because the Anadarko sheriff, our town sheriff, couldn't do anything about it because it was on native land, but it was taking quite a while for the Indian police to come too. So we went to town and came back a couple of hours later and he was still hanging there. It's so sad, but we grew up around that sort of thing. And although it was devastating, we were also just kind of used to it. So I don't know that that story came to mind when I was trying to sift through the differences. And I think that you answered a lot of that, but, but anything else you'd add to that conundrum? So I would say in your situation that you're speaking to, I think that is why we don't have those types of situations because we have these cross deputization agreements. So when you said the Anadarko police department couldn't respond to that, if that happened here with one of those, you know, 55 agencies that were cross commissioned with, and that list grows by the day. So it could be a little off wow. on that, but um, then they could respond mm-hmm. and tell tribal police and they could take action until they learned that the, you know, could, because what we tell our police officers when we're going through these uh, cross commission or answering questions are, this covers you so that when we talk about jurisdiction, that's for judges and attorneys to figure out, not for you. Exactly. Just take care of the situation. <laughs> that's and for you to just, respond to yeah. the safety concern as you need to, and then turn it over to us. And we'll figure out if it needs to go to the federal level, if it can stay here, if it mm-hmm. needs to go to the state court. But that covers us. We don't have as many BIA police here. I know we do have BIA police mm-hmm. um, that our tribal police officers work with, but our tribal uh, officers have SLEC commissions. So that allows them to handle crimes that occur within the reservation boundaries, whether it's federal, uh, whether it's state, or whether it's tribal. 
Um, okay. Through yeah. those cross deputization and, and Rachel, I don't know if you're very uh, familiar with self-governance or compacting, contracting. No. See, we as the Choctaw Nation, we compacted from the federal government many years ago. For example, I was over the health system. So we compacted the health system back in the uh, mid-80s. And so, which means that we took it from them and said, we'll run it, we'll do it. So yeah. most of all of those programs, BIA programs or Indian Health Service programs, if you don't, guess who runs it? The federal government does, right. which is BIA and so on. Gotcha. So that's the reason okay. why we all always have had our Choctaw law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had a lot of BIA law enforcement in our area. Yeah. Because we felt like we could meet our needs of our people better mm -hmm. by doing it our, our own way. And that's what compacting, self-governance, sovereignty is all about. Yeah. And so if I saw a Choctaw police, does it say Choctaw police on the car? Yes, or? yes yeah. it sure does. Very okay. identifiable. And then a, let's say there's a Choctaw member that something's happening in their home and they need to call for the Choctaw police. Do they call 911? Do they call y'all? Or Yes, they call 911. That's what we want to stress to everybody. Okay. You call 911. You call 911. Okay. And through those cross deputization agreements, they're going to send out a first responder. Exactly. And, you okay. know, it doesn't matter whether you're Native. You're still an Oklahoman. <laughs> Even if you're a Choctaw Nation tribal member, you're yeah. still an Oklahoman. Uh, and you gotcha. still might be a resident of, of the city of Calera or Colgate or wherever. You call 911 when there's an emergency. That's what we don't want to stop. Yeah. Uh, once they assess the scene, they get to the scene, and they figure out, oh, this might involve a native. Mm -hmm. Then they can contact our dispatch. They all have those numbers. We've given those out. Um, they will verify immediately if they are a member. But you proceed with w as yeah. normal when you have cross deputization agreements. That's the great thing about them. You proceed as normal. You you work the investigation. You involve tribal police if you need to, and then they turn it over wherever they see fit, wh whether it meets criteria to come here or the state or the federal government. Well, yeah, and Rachel, great. that's where I guess again I, I know. I get my anger up a little bit. And what I mean by that is just, so Governor Stitt will gave the example, well, somebody called 911 and they asked if they were Native American and they said yes. And so they didn't respond. Well, guess what? To me, that is so bad upon that law enforcement or that fire department. Because again, you shouldn't be called, if you call 911, you shouldn't be asking if somebody, if they're Native American, Hispanic, right. black or anything else. Take that off the Take that information. Chart. You go respond to the incident, and that's the reason why those cross deputizations are so critical because it takes away all the jurisdictional issues. Mm -hmm. You go and you take care of that situation, and you you help that individual yeah. or family. Yeah. But then again, as Kara was saying, then jurisdiction comes into play. If it's a criminal thing, then who does it go to? Does it go to city, county, state, federal? Government? That's been happening for years. I mean, <laughs> that they've always decided: are they in the city limits? Are they in the county? Is it state? You know, or is it federal? I mean, I, to me, it's just unbelievable that people would go, oh, are you a you top 10 most wanted? But, but, uh, but oh, but you're Native American? Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to let you go again. Someone's you got know? a knife to your throat. Well, exactly. tell me, what tribe are you? Exactly. I mean, and, but that's how bad that it is and that those people, all people, we have a responsibility as the Choctaw Nation government, as a any city, county, state government, mm -hmm. federal government, we have a responsibility to respond and everybody should respond or I would sue them in a the, heartbeat. Hello. <laughs> taking care of our tribal members. Yes. So, yeah, so that's great for our tribal members to know. You call 911 if you have a problem and you will be taken care of and everything else will happen on the back end that also needs to go from there. So, If they ask you if you're Native American, that's a bad sign immediately. Yeah. So there's the Child Welfare Act, and then there's this McGirt versus Oklahoma thing. Has McGirt affected that Child Welfare Act in any way? So, yes. Uh, and in preparation for that, the five tribal leaders were really great about being prepared for everything that they anticipated could have happened when that decision came down. So the reason that McGirt impacted criminal law and Indian child welfare is because of the language of Indian country in federal law. Yeah. Um, it describes that it's all lands within the reservation. And that language is used not only for the Major Crimes Act, but also used for the Indian Child Welfare Act when it defines reservation boundaries. Okay. Um, and so because tribes have exclusive jurisdiction over Indian children within reservation boundaries, it did it would have affected that, and it did affect that. However, like Chief has, has been saying throughout this podcast that, you know, 
historically the Choctaw Nation and, and tribes have been great about partnering with their with the state government, city governments, and, and making sure that we're looking out for the welfare of children, families, natives. Mm -hmm. And so tribal uh, leaders met and the Choctaw Nation entered into a compact through under the Indian Child Welfare Act, you have the ability to compact with the state and, and make sure that families are taken care of mm -hmm. within states, within tribal boundaries. And so we entered into one of those compacts. And I think Chief touched on it a little bit when he talked about, you know, what that did is it gave us, instead of saying, hey, overnight, be prepared for all of these 800 kids within your reservation oh, wow. boundaries who might be in custody to take care of them. Mm -hmm. It allowed us to enter into a compact with the state and view those on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Is, this, is this a case we can provide services for and we need to take in tribal court? You still have the ability to transfer those cases under the, the Indian Child Welfare Act. The best services. No, that, absolutely. Yes. And so, uh, you know, that compact has really been, uh, I think it was crucial for all of the five tribes to do. Mm -hmm. And it has made sure that kids didn't get left out, that kids weren't falling under the cracks, that those cases that needed to remain in state court would remain, mm -hmm. and that on a case-by-case -case basis, it did expand our sovereignty and expand our ability to have say in how children were treated, how they were being treated within the child welfare system mm -hmm. of the state, and gave us more access to that information. Wow. Uh, it's, this must be such a win, too, to be able to take care of your own tribal children as well. But, you know, those compacts just show how well we can work together yeah. when we leave our egos behind and just yeah. look out for the best interest of Oklahomans and Natives alike. Absolutely. That's very exciting. You know, when we were talking about jurisdiction earlier, I'm trying to think of what questions would tribal members have because I am one and I have a thousand questions on this. So when I first started reading about this, I was thinking, oh, does this mean we're going to have reservations as in, you know, it's sad to say, but there are reservations out there that had horrible living conditions. Is that what's going to happen to people who live in those districts and all that? But when you said it's about jurisdiction more than anything else, that really kind of helped paint a good picture for us of what all of this means. You know, we debated whether to use a different terminology than reservation because most people, when they think of reservation, they think of the western part of the United yeah. States, Navajo Nation, for example, which is land-based reservations versus jurisdictional reservations like where we have here. And I think that's really confusing to people. And again, the reason why my assumption and what I've seen in some of the study that we've looked at is a lot of times, one is geography is tough for people. That's when they're on a reservation yeah. where there's no resources of, available. But also if you are going to take full authority over your reservation, you have to have a ton of money. You have to be able to almost be like right. the federal government to print your own money because you're going to have to take care from birth, you know, from womb to tomb, mm -hmm. if you will. It means you're and going to have to tax your people. Like exactly. You, right? and are we willing to tax our people? That becomes an issue, you know, because right now we make our own dollars through our, our revenues, through our own businesses. We do not tax our people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you start having streets that fall apart, more so than they are through, <laughs> through, through Berkeley, I mean, you know, it's, it's all those things. Yeah. Are, again, with the, this responsibility comes great accountability, and we just have to weigh all of that. But uh, before I forget, one thing I wanted to mention to earlier that I hope that our tribal members understand is the, the Bossy decision, the Bossy case. I don't know if people are familiar with that. In the past, there was this uh, understanding that because of the, the McGurk ruling, that this would apply back to, you know, years, hundreds of years. Oh, retroactive. Uh, retroactive. And the Bossy case has ruled that that is not the case. Okay. That it's only from the date that the, the law went into place. And I'm, I'm using my terms, not a legal yes. term. But, yes. Carrie, you may want to explain Yeah, and, and, and the Bossy case was up on an appeal on cert. And then this decision came out that was Wallace v. Matloff. And basically it says that if those convictions, if the sentence has expired, so, you know, they said all of these people are going to be released from like 20 years ago. Oh, my gosh. No one will have jurisdiction to prosecute. What they said was once that conviction is final, you can't come back and attack it. That's what the oh, state of okay. Oklahoma courts have said. Mm -hmm. And so those, it really cut down on the amount of cases we looked at getting overnight. Oh, my gosh. 
those people who are incarcerated are not going to be released on post-conviction relief applications is the big thing to remember. Okay. And so it's only going to be those cases that were pending at the time. And I think that was huge. I think it really undercut Oklahoma's argument that the sky is falling, everybody's getting out of jail, uh, you won't be able to find <laughs> victims, because it's only applying to a limited amount of cases that were pending at the time that decision came down. Okay. So yeah. that's kind of decreased some of my anxiety, at least, because yeah, I know I'm not getting thousands. Well, it, cases. And for, for me as a tribal leader, I know I had seen it with some of our tribal members. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is some of those people, their family members had been murdered. And oh. so they were having to go through trial again and have to relive that murder no. and, and or rape or whatever it may be. And that was really devastating to the family. So I could have said again, that's what I, I keep harping about tribal members. I hope they really understand. I could have said, we're all sovereign. We want to take on all those cases and make our families go through and live through that horrible experience again? Or could we just say, hey, this law is good. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Those people were convicted. Let's go ahead and let them remain convicted under that law. And that's what they ruled. And so, and I'm very thankful that they oh, did. Oh, absolutely. And, and Chief, you and the other, uh, it was at all five of the chiefs that signed yes. on to a brief that actually was in support of the yes. state keeping those cases. Oh, wow. And so okay. I think that that's really important to note that Chief and the other tribes, uh, mm -hmm. the other five tribes did sign off to a brief supporting that. And, and that the, and they followed your guidance and, and found that it was, it was not retroactive to all those cases. All agreement on that. Yes. So much here. You know, there's one question I, I've always wondered, and I think I looked it up one time. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. How many terms does a chief get? We do not have term limits okay. in the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, we've always felt like the people will decide term limits. <laughs> so, okay. which means that uh, if, if they don't like the job that I'm doing, then they will they'll elect a new chief and, and so on. Yeah. And so we've never had uh, that happen. And so I don't know. There may be a point in time when our tribal members feel like there needs to be term limits and they'll, they'll vote on it. And if they do, then that will be the law of the land. That that's what yeah. will happen. The, the the tribal members also have that. There's two ways to amend, like the constitution or change law. That mm -hmm. is either they can do a petition, and uh, which has to be I think one half of the people that voted in the last chief's election, yeah. or through our tribal council can uh, propose a constitutional amendment. So okay. if they want to propose something like that. That would be their choice. Okay, good to know. Thank you. You know, the one thing is I, we get asked a lot about is protective orders because okay. it's quasi criminal, quasi civil. Yeah, and, and that's something that I've let you, you know it has already been addressed, and that's a lot of things people worry about or things that have already been thought of and addressed, right. but. Uh, protective orders have been an issue with domestic violence. And so VAWA, the legislation I talked about earlier that gave us the special domestic violence jurisdiction mm -hmm. that allowed us to prosecute non-natives depending on their relationship status with natives, that that also addressed protective orders in Indian country. Okay. And so it's not going to change your protective order. Your protective order is still valid because under VAWA that was signed, signed in 2013, it said that tribal government, states, and the federal government, everybody will give full faith and credit to other protective orders yeah. that are validly issued. And so the, I think that was a big thing we got at first is a lot of people, uh, victims of domestic violence, were concerned about whether their protective orders would be valid because mm -hmm. they were issued by a state entity and they were tribal. Yeah. And yes, they are. <laughs> Good to know. Yes, yes. So rest assured, those yes. who have gone through that process, it still stands. And Yes, that's a common question. We yeah. One of the things I thought was interesting, Rachel, that I think we need to clarify for our tribal members and, and viewers as a whole is that I, I guess I expected people, which it's good that they don't really don't know the state's court systems and they don't know tribal court systems. <laughs> and what I mean by that right. is, and do you mind Kara just talk about, I think we, we will say district court, okay. you know, we'll say criminal court, you know, I, I don't know that people really understand what is the dividing line between mm. that, between civil and criminal and so on. Do you mind explaining yeah, that? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So here at the Choctaw Nation, we have a civil jurisdiction. You have to opt into that. Okay. So McGirt didn't affect that. If you wanted to have a divorce here and you were non-tribal, you could waive oh. jurisdiction and ha if you had a tribal member that you were divorcing and, and enter into our civil jurisdiction. 
But for criminal jurisdiction, that's what affected was affected by McGurk. But, yeah. Do you mind just, I don't oh, think people understand just the simplicity. What is cases under civil? So criminal jurisdiction is going to be anything that you can go to jail for. Okay. So traffic citation, misdemeanor cases, or felony serious crime cases. Yeah. That's going to be your criminal jurisdiction. Civil jurisdiction is going to be divorces, uh, mm -hmm. suing somebody for money. Um, the other type of civil cases are deprived action. So when the, there's government intervention and they remove mm -hmm. your child, that is a civil action. Okay. Even though the prosecutor's office is involved in that, that's still a civil action. Um, and then we have a quasi-civil uh, civil case, which is your delinquent cases. Mm -hmm. uh, delinquent cases are not really criminal, but they have a criminal component. Yeah. You did something wrong, and, and you need to go to the court system to see what we can do to, to, to rehabilitate this juvenile. So when we talk about civil jurisdiction, we're mainly talking about suing people, divorcing people, <laughs> or something of that nature, right. or seeking a protective order. That would be a civil type case. And those are the types of cases that can be handled in the Choctaw Nation courts. Yes. The yes. other types of cases that are handled in the Choctaw Nation courts are criminal cases. And that's when you commit a crime. You violate the, the law, whether it's wildlife law, uh, traffic law, or mm -hmm. um, you commit a misdemeanor or felony. Okay. And, and those are also the types of cases that we hear in tribal court. No, this is good stuff. I'm glad well, you said that. Well, because uh, so many times our people just, I don't think they understand, even like I said, in yeah. a uh, county or, or a state, they just, until they go to court for a ticket that they failed to pay, you know, or three tickets that they failed to pay, then they're just like, they just know they get a summons to, right. to appear in court and yeah. that's it. But then they go, Oh my goodness, I could go to jail for this. Yeah. Then what, then they start, they don't understand that whole separation. And that's the reason yeah. why I don't think people really understand when I say that the, um, this McGirt really only deals with the major crimes act at this point mm -hmm. in time. So we are talking the criminal, which is, rape, the murders, yeah. and those types of things. We're not talking about the suing and the divorce. Do we have that system in place? Yes, we do. But like we've talked about taxation, all those types of things. I mean, what are, how are we going to handle it? I'm, for example, we partner with some of our cities right now. Mm -hmm. Say that they give a person a ticket and they're a tribal member. They will come to our tribal court, but then we remit portion of that money back to them. And so back to the districts real quick. How many districts are there? 12. 12 districts. Okay. Can you name some of them? Is it still Pushmataha? And oh, well, like no, that? no. We have just districts 1 through 12 oh, now. Okay. And so when we came across the, the Trail of Tears, we had three districts at that time of okay. Pukshinubi, Mushlatubi, and Pushmataha. But now we have the 12 districts. And so, gotcha. and again, it's in the Constitution, which who knows when they'll do it, but the Tribal Council is supposed to be looking at redistricting. It oh. says as needed. For example, in Bryan County here, this population has exploded. Uh, and so they may have to look at redistricting mm -hmm. and see how that will work out. And, and they'll still have 12 districts. Then. So for tribal members that are in a certain district, what are their rights versus someone who does not live in that district? Well, virtually, or a district? Well, uh, if you live within the Choctaw Nation, I mean, you're eligible for all services. Uh, if you, even if you live outside now, typically the only time that there's restrictions is if it's money from the federal government because they restrict those dollars to usually your reservation. Yeah. But all the tribal programs that we have funded, typically I think about emergency services, higher education, housing programs. We've made all those programs nationwide because it's dollars that the Choctaw Nation has generated and put into I it. So we can establish that. our we can establish our own guidelines. Yeah. I remember when I was in college, I used to get the commodity food, the commodity cheese. Yes. I had so much of it. Isn't I it would, so good? Oh, it's so good. I love some of it. It's so good. And I don't know why. But, you know, it comes in that brown box. I remember sometimes I, I would get so much of it as one person in college that I would just put a bow on it and give it to, you know, a cousin for Christmas, you know. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Okay. But but I would I was in Weatherford at Southwestern Oklahoma State at the time, and I would drive somewhere out there, way out, to go get those commodity foods, and it was not the Choctaw Nation that I was getting it from. Right. So there's cases like that where people can be, or my sister, she goes to uh, a non-Choctaw hospital mm -hmm. for when she has needs. So can you explain to us why that works that way, how that works? There's like this intertribal helping 
other tribal members, right? Well, it's partly that's who we are as people, but it's also the federal, how we get receive federal funding. So when we receive federal funding here within our Choctaw reservations for all Native Americans, so like our okay. health system, our commodity program, it's for all Native Americans. Oh. Now we can give preference sometimes to, uh, to in certain programs to our tribal members, mm -hmm. but then there's times that we can't. And I know that's where people get so upset because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe a, uh, contract health, which is where you go to our health system, then you get referred out. Well, maybe a Chickasaw that lives in our area that they got referred out, but it's because they had a heart attack. A Choctaw may got, have gotten re referred out for just a heart cath or something that may be not as serious mm -hmm. and it didn't get funded. And it's hard for people to understand and explain that that prioritization is really based according to the federal funding. It yeah. has nothing to do because typically, again, if it's tribal funding, we can definitely give preference to our tribal members. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. And I love that, that if someone is in need, they can go to any tribal facility and, and get some help. So like uh, if there's Choctaws, there's about 10,000 Choctaws that live in Oklahoma City. They go to the Oklahoma City Urban Clinic up there. Okay. And so they're able to receive services now. Do they receive as much services probably as they do here in the Choctaw Nation? No, they don't because they don't have a hospital for one thing. Okay. They just have so it's whatever is available. It's whatever is available that Indian yeah. Health Service, the federal government, provides for that area. Well, and I will say it certainly helped me when I was able to get my eye care, dental care, health care when I was in college. And, you know, I paid for college myself and had three jobs. And, you know, when I needed stuff, I it, it was great to know that I could go get that help. And I'm sure a lot of people do appreciate that. So... Thank you both so much for this helpful information. And now I'm off to take a tour of the Choctaw Nation's new Judicial Center. But before I do, what goes on in the Judicial Center? On a daily basis, people are coming in, filing paperwork, filing protective orders, and we're having hearings almost every day of the week now. Yeah. Wow. We are having either civil hearings, juvenile cases heard, guardianships heard, or we're having criminal cases heard. Um, so it's a really exciting time right now. It's open to the public. Um, I know we have some COVID restrictions right now, but you know, it, it's an open facility. So if, if members want to come in and watch a proceeding, they're more than welcome to. I think we have jury trials coming up at the end of the year. Um, and so that's something I'd just like to throw out there. You know, <laughs> we, we have native and non-natives on our juries because we have that okay. special domestic violence jurisdiction. Yeah. So if you're sent a summons, be sure and show up and be part of the process. Yeah. But in Rachel, as the chief, I do not go over there. And, and part of the reason why I do not is because that's not my authority. Okay. I mean, I, I don't want to start going over there where people go, well, hey, I can go to the chief. <laughs> not meaning just from a political perspective, yeah. but I do not. One of my goals is, it is again, if it's going to be the best judicial system, it's they're able to make their own decisions unbiased. unbiased. And yeah. so last thing I want is for me to walk in over there, a tribal member that I may know, either a victim or for, or uh, being uh, on the other side of the table, mm -hmm. is I do not want to go in there and go, why aren't you helping this person? Why aren't you doing this? Yeah. Because then I'm affecting the court system, and which is sense. not the role of the chief of the Choctaw Nation. That's the judicial system. So yeah. I, I never never go over there. I, I will go over there when they're not in session mm -hmm. and and just see how things are working and, and talk to the staff and things yeah. like that. But at court session, I do not want to, to be a part of that. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, now, it's kind of sad. I've been over there. I, I told you I adopted. I shouldn't say sad. It's a good thing. I adopted both of my children. Yeah. It was through our court system. Oh, so wow. That was, that's pretty cool. And in cool. that building over there? No, okay. not in that building. This yeah. is, that was when I was a young person, not, not at this age. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, be sure to check out photos of the new Judicial Center and my visit with the Chief and Kara on my Native Chalk Talk Facebook page. Because what we never thought could possibly happen happened. This whole tribal sovereignty thing, who knows what can happen next? I look forward to seeing what's in store for our tribe. And before we go, are there any words of wisdom that you both would like to share with myself and our listeners? Kara, I'm going to put you on the spot. Stay out of trouble? Uh, yeah, don't break the law. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. To the point. Well, I think for me, it's just um, the sky's the limit. We do not need to restrict ourselves, but we need to be realistic. We yeah. need to be visionaries. We need to think of the future. We need to keep our tribal members always at our heart and first forethought in mm -hmm. our minds on how we're approaching this. And uh, and I would encourage our tribal members to do the same. Well said. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Yakuki.
Pisolačky. Jako ki. Jako ki. Potential is everywhere in the Choctaw people. It's in our schools and students. It's in our small businesses and entrepreneurs. Potential is in our lifestyle and health. It's in our culture and heritage. Passion and commitment is in our blood. Ingenuity and economy are a tradition. And the Chutla Foundation was founded for this potential. To cultivate minds and hearts, to stimulate ideas and passions, to extend lives and improve health through education, and to preserve and promote the power of our past. The Chatha Foundation, meeting the potential of the Choctaw people. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>